G'day everyone, Dicko here with another kick-ass walkthrough. This is episode 2 of a multi-part series covering texturing stylized characters. In this video, we are going to try and block out the colors of our character with as little effort as possible. So, how do we do that, might you ask? Well, the idea here is to not actually do any texturing at this stage. We're going to play with the node editor to get as much color information as possible into the skin of our character here, and then bake in the details in the next video. So you might be looking at this video right now and going, wait a minute, this guy is sculpting in a texturing video. What's going on? Well, the reason why I'm doing this and also the reason why I'm blasting through it with a time lapse is because, well, one, it's completely optional and up to you. And two, it's a pretty simple process. It's just a multi-resolution modifier and it's been ramped up a few subdivisions and I'm just sculpting in some extra detail because I can. And three, I actually need to in some cases because this character is meant to be kind of middle-aged and the model as it is, without that sort of sculpted in detail, kind of looks too young for my character. So I need to sculpt in the wrinkles in his face, some, you know, definition in his chest, all that sort of stuff. And all that uh, extra detail that I'm sculpting into my character here, I'll be able to actually bake that into my textures as a normal map or a displacement map or a bump map um, to bring back that aged look into my character. So that's why it's optional for you. And it's optional for especially characters that are younger and even especially more optional for those who are making ultra stylized characters. So to summarize, if you want to get some extra detail to your textures, just add a multi-res sculpt and move on. And if you're not going with the multi-res method, just slap on a subdivision surface modifier instead. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, we're ready to start on the material. So the first thing I want you to do is to switch your render engine out from EV and into cycles, because that's the only way we will be able to bake in the textures in the next video. And of course, if you have a GPU on hand, uh, make sure you switch over to GPU rendering as well. Okay, the next thing we want to do is to change the background color in the world settings to a sort of slightly off white. So the reason we're doing that is because we don't need to have any lights in the scene this way and it still provides us with a very even light setup across the entire model because we are effectively using the background color as our light source. Okay, with a standard PBR material assigned to the character model, we are going to start to block out our colors. So make sure you have Node Wrangler enabled as an add-on before we get going because it's going to become really useful in the future. Okay, so starting by pushing Shift-A on your keyboard and looking for the Ambient Occlusion node, we are going to take the color output and put it into our base color input of our material. And look at what happens. We get some dark shadows in the crevices of our character. And quick observation, it also includes the details from my multi-res. Okay, we're going to now link up a ramp node in between the ambient occlusion node and our principal shader node. And this node is going to really help us block out most of the colors. Okay, so ambient occlusion is basically defined as the sort of areas of a mesh or an object that is less likely to be affected by ambient light, which is why we get that shadowing in those little pitted areas of the body. But we can use that to our advantage using this ramp node by changing the colors on that ramp to sort of simulate the change in color tone of our skin by assigning the ramp with different colors. So notice now that if we change the colors from black and white to some skin tone colors, we can really easily block out some very simple, basic uh, skin tones for our body. And we can add more than just two colors. We can add a range of colors to really play with the skin tones here. So there might be a moment when you're doing this that you uh, notice that the skin tones aren't matching the colors in the actual ramp. And that's probably because Blender's default color management is set to filmic. And while that's great for rendering out nice neutral images for post-production, it's not great for rendering out baked textures. So it might be a good idea to change your view transform from filmic to standard and the look to none. I can't say with certainty that this is a great idea, but 
it does help me to make sure that my viewport matches my ramp colors. Okay, moving on, let's start to flesh out our skin tones a little bit more. So with that same ramp, we are going to add some more points of color. So adding the little plus icon, we can now add another color in between our purple and our lighter yellow. And notice how it's sort of taking on the information in between the crevices of our character here. We're getting some nice skin tone transition between the purple and that dark pink. And the yellow is sort of peeking at the areas where it's most exposed to ambient light. And this is why I kind of did the multi-res at the start for my personal character because it's getting all that detail into the cracks and crevices of his wrinkles, which is really cool. Not only that, by not relying on texturing straight out of the bat, we are also able to procedurally just test and experiment with different color tones. So I don't have to paint in one color, not like it, then paint in another color, not like it, etc, 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 and take all that fucking time to finish it. I can just slide a few sliders around, change colors as I will, and choose whatever I think is best for this character. And you might be looking at, say, the underside of the nose and thinking that's a bit too dark that's not quite right but here's the thing it's just the base layer so once we bake in the texture and all this lighting information we can always edit it after the fact but the fact is we have a very clean easy base to work from with as little effort as possible we're six minutes into this video i am not really uh speeding up the footage by any means we are literally six minutes into this video and we've blocked out almost all of the main colors the rest here is just tweaking. So we're just gonna tweak with the colors and notice how I actually added a bit more highlight on the very end of that ramp to get in some of that, uh, you know, that bulk showing a little bit. And I think it looks pretty cool. Now for a little bit of an extra touch, we're going to actually add another node and we're going to use this node to add some extra sort of um, highlights to the sharper areas of my character design here using the geometry node. And notice down the bottom of that node is a thing called pointedness and we can use that to our advantages as well. So we're going to add another ramp to that pointedness. And let me just demonstrate what pointedness does. It's just a fancy word for curvature, essentially. But um, what we can do, we can clamp down this ramp to really isolate those details in his chest clavicle, uh, the curvature of his jawline and brow line. So just by tweaking those little values and just a bit of trial and error and wiggle room, we get this sort of a result. And what we can do, we can actually use this as a sort of layer mask of sorts to allow us to mix a highlight color with our ramp on the ambient occlusion node. And by the way, if you're wondering how I'm isolating that ramp node to be visualized in the viewport, I just held down shift and control and then clicked on that color ramp. And that only works with the node wrangler turned on. So in your add-ons, make sure that's turned on. Okay, so now that we've got this nice pointedness going on, we've got these highlights showing up, we can actually mix these together with a mix RGB node. So we're gonna add in a mix RGB, and this time with this second ramp, we're going to put that into the factor of our uh, mix RGB node. So we get this kind of result. So, to demonstrate, I'm just going to change the color of our secondary color here to a bright purpley pink or something. Just something that we can visualize this with. And if we play with that ramp again in the uh, pointedness, you can see that the, uh, the values are starting to show. So this is great if you want to add some highlights once we change that color from purple to something a bit more natural toned. And you may have noticed a few artifacts on the guy's face there. And I'm not sure why that's happening, but the point is uh, we can always edit those out after the fact, after we've baked in everything. So it's not a big deal for me. And I'm sure there's another way of getting these details to show on the mesh. But in order to keep the nodes set up nice and simple, and not so complicated and just gives you fast results and is getting you 90% of the way there, this is fine. And again, this is a completely optional part of this process, 
but if you want to get that kind of highlight detail in there without much effort, this is definitely something to consider. And you can see I'm trying to figure out what's going on with those artifacts and I just kind of just give up. I know they're going to edit it anyway. It doesn't matter. Okay, so once you're happy with the sort of gradient and the uh, the proportion of your body that has those highlight details, it's now time to change the color to something a little bit more natural and a bit more appealing for your character. So in my case, it's just almost a pure white. Um, I might bring it the tone down to maybe a little bit of a yellowy skin tone, but otherwise it's a pretty bright color. But it gives me the results I like and I really really like the effect it's giving me so i'm going to keep it like that and just see how much detail we've been able to get into this thing without really touching a brush at all amazing results for what is essentially almost no effort all right so now we're going to add something that might not necessarily be used for the texture bake in the future but it will be useful in the future for rendering in general, especially if you're going to be using Cycles or Eevee with subsurface scattering. And for those who don't know what subsurface scattering is, it's basically just the uh, the light that shines through your body and scatters through the skin and flesh in this really soft dispersed nature when it's in harsh sunlight. So for instance, when you put a lamp to your fingers and they turn red, that is subsurface scattering. And we're going to achieve this with a little bit of vertex painting. So to add a vertex paint, we need to have a vertex group. And to do that, you just add one through the vertex group window in your mesh properties. So you push the little plus icon and you'll add a vertex group. And before you start painting, make sure you disable your multi-res temporarily Otherwise, the painting process will grind down to a halt because of all that mesh information. So, so yeah, uh, make sure you then label your vertex groups appropriately. In this case, I've named it as SSS to equal subsurface scattering. And you've noticed I've also added another one called Cull for color. And I may or may not use that in this video, but um, it can be used for adding some extra color detail if we wish. Okay, now switching into the vertex paint mode, we're going to flood the whole body with a black color because that's going to be used as a mask in the future. So uh, there's no paint bucket tool in vertex paint at the moment, but if you push shift K on your keyboard with the black color assigned, it will flood instantly. I know it's a little bit weird that there's no paint bucket tool in the vertex paint, but in texture paint mode there is, but I don't know why. So what we're going to do now is change our brush color to white. And this is going to represent the areas that we want the subsurface scattering to be its strongest. So usually in areas where um, the skin is relatively thin. So the fingers, the nose, the ears, um, and other fleshy parts such as that. You know what I mean, right? And you may have noticed I turned back on my multi-res because I was being a cocky little shit thinking that Ooh, my computer's fast enough. It's strong enough to handle this. And the answer it gave back to me was, no, it's not asshole. I'm going to be as slow as shit. So yes, eventually I do turn off the multi-res for the viewport. So as I'm painting, notice how I'm being pretty broad with my strokes because I don't really care about detail here because I'm going to blur the crap out of this in the future. That's just how subsurf scattering works. It's very gentle. It's very soft. So, you know, painting in minute details ain't going to help that much. And notice that even though I have my multi-res turned on and now that I turn it off, I'm really only painting on a very limited amount of vertices here. Basically, the low poly mesh that underlies that multi-res is what I'm painting on. So, you know, again, being very broad with my brushes makes sense in this case. So again, I'm very roughly going over areas that I know where the skin is thin or it's got cartilage or just generally kind of soft and squishy. So the eyebrows, the ears, the nose, the eyelids, all those sort of areas. And you can see I'm being very rough with it because, again, I'm going to blur the crap out of it.
Okay, so once you've done those sort of major regions, it's time to use the blur brush. And I'm just going to go with a very broad brush and then blur this shit out of those white values. Okay, let's speed this up because it's not very interesting to watch. So once you're happy with that, we have to hook it up to our subsurface input on our principal shader. And now if you do have a multi-res and you want to turn it back on, now's the time to do it because we are no longer needing to paint in anything else with that vertex color map. And just to be clear, vertex coloring is not the same as texturing. With vertex coloring, you are basically assigning a vertice with a specific color value, and those values are not immediately being copied onto a texture map, like traditional texturing. Anyway, back into our material node, we are going to add a vertex color node, and then choose the SSS option in our list there. And then we're going to hook that up into another ramp node, and that ramp will be connected to the subsurface value. And just to be clear, not the subsurface color as it appears to be looking like there. I'm merely previewing my input with the node wrangler there. But we need to hook up to the subsurface value, which is above the subsurface color. And you're going to see me hook it up in a moment. So grabbing that color output, I'm going to hook it straight into the subsurface value. And I'm going to reconnect my principal shader to my material output. And you're seeing this weird thing going on. And the reason why that's happening is because the black value means that there's absolutely zero subsurf. So we need to actually lighten that up on the ramp. So it's got a slight gray undertone on that end of the ramp there. And that will fix up that uh, subsurface artifacting there. And with a bit of tweaks, you should get something like this. It looks a little bit more noisy, but that's to be expected, especially with subsurface scattering. And I'm going to bring down the white value down to somewhere around a mid gray. And just to demonstrate, you don't have to follow me here. I'm just going to add a basic light and I'm going to shine it against the back of the ear or the fingers here to show you how that subsurface works. So now that that's loading up and processing all that calculation, you will see the uh, the red highlights at the tip of the fingers coming out there, just like in real life. So if I move the camera around to just under the fingers, you'll see that the subsurface is working pretty good underneath that area and going a bit more denser up the hand where that blur that we made is going to black. Same thing around the ears. So if we bring that value around there, you can see that the red undertones around the ears are starting to pop up. So let's get rid of that light and bring back our white background and we'll have a look at the whole thing as a whole. And yeah, I'm pretty happy with that result. Uh, nice, easy way to get your base color up and running. And we really haven't done any texturing yet. And you can see that by the fact that our textures on the right side there are completely black and have zero image information on it. And that's why the next video will be so damn important because we're going to talk about texture baking. Oh God, good luck with that. Anyway, catches and have fun.